Well, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to bring the slides up here. Um, it's a beautiful morning. It's not snowing, though it took us like 45 minutes to dig out of the snow this weekend. I'm sure you guys had the same thing. Um, I'm not sure if it's a good thing to have me present the last Grand Round on this year, but I think I hope I'll put a good seal on this uh, year Grand Rounds. Um, I'd like to thank uh, MHIF and uh, top of that, Dr. Scott Sharkey, who have always been very supportive to um, our vascular research and appreciate the intern program. And then so um, today I'm going to talk about a very hot topic, antithrombotic therapies in stable perforate disease and also in post revascularization. I chose this topic after thinking a while because the, this topic is being really hot in the literature for coronary artery disease. As you know, peripheral arterial disease have, you know, has always been underrepresented or undertreated. And sometimes we face these patients and should, what should we do? What should we give these patients knowing that they are even higher risk than patients with coronary artery disease? So I started this project as um, a, a year goal uh, to help my vascular surgery providers to choose the right antithrombotic therapy, but then I thought about, well, we already did a lot of work, so, I, um, so we kind of thought about writing a review paper with the help of Dr. Giordano and Dr. Uh, Robinson here, our fellows. We were able to write this paper, and it's in press right now with, with angiology. But then I thought, well, let's take it to the next step and <laughs> present a grand round on it. So this is kind of an introduction to what I'm going to be talking about, <clears throat> disclosures, Nothing uh, kind of relevant, and there's no really financial conflict. It's evidence-based as well. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to cover uh, uh, peripheral arterial disease is a major atherosclerotic uh, disease that actually has worse outcome than coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease. So when you see CVD here, I don't mean cardiovascular disease. I mean cerebrovascular disease. Uh, we're going to cover antithrombotic therapies for patients with chronic stable uh, PED, also after revascularization, if that's different or not. We're going to cover the current guideline recommendation, and also we're going to share our protocols that we just finished and published online, and I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. And we're going to end up uh, with summary. Just to let you know, there are a lot of papers out in the literature, and I'm going to just going to focus on control randomized trials with good sample size. We are not going to just go over every single paper because you're going to see a lot of them. So you know that there are different antiplatelet therapy with different targets. We had aspirin for many, many, many years with the thrombexane uh, receptor inhibitor that inhibits platelet aggregation. We have P2Y12 inhibitors that um, help to inhibit activation or platelet activation and aggregation. We also have vorapaxar, which made a lot of noise when it first got approved, but we don't uh, tend to use it too much. It's a protease, uh, and, uh, protease receptor um, antagonist that helps to reduce uh, platelet aggregation, where it actually it blocks the, uh, um, the combination of thrombin into its receptor on platelet, uh, helping to reduce platelet aggregation. Uh, and there are those IV agents that we've used in acute coronary syndrome, uh, G2B3A inhibitors, and that also helps to reduce platelet aggregation. You guys are very familiar. I've given a lot of talks on anticoagulation cascades, and, um, and we know that we have two different um, uh, new groups, like factor 10 inhibitors, rivaroxaban, uh, pexaban, and so forth, and we have direct thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran, and the question is how to um, combine, <laughs> yeah, how to combine these kind of uh, antithrombotic thrombotic therapy in the right place for the right patient, right? So uh, decision making can be very challenging because not only you have to know the agents and the side effects, but you also have always to carry the throm thrombotic events on your left hand and bleeding events on the right hand and try to balance between both. So. <clears throat> You know that peripheral arterial disease is a major health problem. Uh, we have about 236 million people with peripheral arterial disease. That's up from uh, 200 million in 2010. It's actually the incidence increases year after year. Uh, it's the third most common atherosclerotic disease after coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease with significant morbidity, mortality, and disability. Uh, it costs a lot of money also to the economy as well, too. 
uh, compared to coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease, the evidence for antithrombotic therapy is not that much that we see, which I'm going to go over that in details. Uh, despite the fact we know that uh, peripheral artery disease has worse outcome than CED and cerebrovascular disease, but we don't have a whole lot of papers especially focusing on PED patients. Pathophysiology for peripheral artery disease, you know, not only we see atherosclerosis-related stenosis, but also we see atherothrombosis and, and thromboembolism as well, too. Interestingly, this paper was very interesting to see. That was published in 2018 in American College of Cardiology. That looking at patients that presented with femoral popliteal or infrapopliteal uh, peripheral artery disease, and actually the paper talks about different pathophysiologists. You guys know that there is, you know, um, atherosclerotic plaque. I thought that this will be 90% of the underlying etiology for peripheral artery disease. But also there are acute thrombi that form that can cause this kind of stenosis. There are also chronic thrombi. Based on this paper, we're actually looking at uh, uh, um, peripheral artery disease with more than equal or, or more than 70% stenosis, about 73% uh, of these uh, patients had actually thrombi contributing to the uh, stenosis. And as a matter of fact, 67% of these patients, um, uh, these thrombi, were not associated with significant atherosclerotic disease. We always focus on atherosclerosis but we don't think about atherothrombosis. This is a new terminology that we started to look at uh, when evaluating patients with peripheral artery disease or even coronary artery disease. So you guys know very well the atherosclerotic plaque and so forth, and you'll get the rupture or interruption of the membrane, and you get the platelets to stick around, red blood cells. And, uh, and we always focused on uh, uh, antiplatelet therapy to treat this disease. But remember that you need fibrin or your fibrin to connect this kind of thrombus plug, right? And fibrin is the final product of the coagulation cascade, so we don't think about anticoagulation therapy in the mix, right? We kind of didn't think about this for a while until recent trial looking at anti anticoagulant, anticoagulant um, uh, agents in the mix to help reduce risk of atherothrombosis. So that's what we're going to also focus on today. And we can't pass by without talking about the REACH registry to understand the prevalence, prevalence risk factors and clinical consequences or prognosis of, of patients with atherosclerotic disease, including CED, PED, and CVD. And that's actually an observational registry that included 68,000 patients from around the globe with underlying coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, or cerebrovascular disease, and looking at the prevalence, risk factors, and prognosis. And interestingly, um, as you see here, for MACE outcome, cardiovascular death, you know, and unfailed or slow, and unfailed MI, uh, depicted in red for peripheral artery disease and blue and coronary artery disease in first, second, third, fourth years, you see a really exponential uh, increase on the risk over time. And maybe numerically, there are more risk um, actually with uh, PED than CED. Not only that, we see almost kind of a triple or a quadruple really risk uh, between first and fourth year. So we see that this risk of MACE increases year after year, and that's despite um, actually standard of care therapy, including statins, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and so forth, which is scary, right? Um, if you add hospitalization to MACE, and you look at uh, that in three years, actually PED takes uh, number one here for in terms of hospitalization or and MACE, 40% versus 30%, 28% for CAD and cerebrovascular disease. And if you look at the male outcome, when I talk about male, it's not the female counterpart. It's uh, major limb adverse events. Um, so it's 5.7% in patients with peripheral artery disease in, in, in two years, and that goes up to 24% at year uh, four. So, and that's, again, despite available antithrombotic therapy, statins, ACE inhibitors, name it, right? This is very high risk in these patients. And also, um, based on risk respective analysis, looking at patients that actually underwent revascularization, and looking at this outcome, if you look at uh, 38,000 patients at 1.4 years, you see a really significant composite uh, you know, of MI, ischemic stroke, cardiovascular death, acute limp ischemia, and major amputation. And you see this, in, uh, you know, if you see a subgroup here for MI, uh, ischemic stroke, and so forth. And that's after revascularization. So after performing an open-end revascular 
uh, revascularization for these patients, the risk of having MACE or limp event significant high. And that's, again, despite appropriate antithrombotic therapy. So management challenges, uh, we do have data that secondary prevention with antithrombotic therapy in atherosclerotic diseases does actually reduce MACE outcome. But most of this data is extrapolated from uh, data from coronary artery disease. And PED is usually underrepresented in these trials. And patients with uh, peripheral ischia disease is under-treated as well as under-represented, as I just said. Uh, and most of the data that we have for PED comes from CED, um, actually, database. And that's why, knowing that C PED has, it's very prevalent, high risk, we really need to do a good job in treating these patients very carefully. Um, so now we're going to talk about the antithrombotic therapy in stable chronic uh, PED, and we'll talk about after open and after endovascular revascularization. So talking about aspirin in stable peripheral arterial disease, the, da the data comes from the CLIPS trial, the critical leg, uh, uh, leg ischemia prevention study, looking at 366 patients with peripheral arterial disease and claudication. Uh, the patients were randomized to receive aspirin versus placebo, uh, looking at the outcome of MACE and CLI in two years. There was really significant reduction in MACE and CLI uh, with aspirin versus placebo. And if you look at sub, uh, subgroup analysis, even also, uh, there was significant reduction of MI uh, plus uh, non-failure and non-failure MI. And also, there was significant reduction of vascular events and critical limp ischemia. So aspirin does make sense to consider in patients with stable peripheral arterial disease. And there was a question whether clopidogrel or P2Y12 would make better sense than just the aspirin. And the famous Capri trial uh, tried to answer this question. Actually, the Capri trial was published in 1998. You still hear, hear it most often when you talk about antithrombotic therapy and atherosclerotic diseases. So it looked at uh, about 20,000 patients with atherosclerotic disease, ischemic stroke, MI, or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, randomized to high-dose aspirin 325 versus clopidogrel, and looking at duration of 1.9 years, and looking at MACE outcome, there was really significant reduction of, of, of MACE with clopidogrel versus high-dose aspirin. And if you look at the PED subgroup, actually that's what drew the uh, import significance in, in terms of improved MACE outcomes. So patients with peripheral arterial disease also saw significant reduction of MACE if you were to use clopidogrel uh, versus aspirin. And that's, we'll see this reflected in the guidelines when we talk about this. Uh, then the Euclid trial got published in 2017. I was the PI from this institution on this trial looking at the Kegrolor, right? So the Kegrolor is, is a reversible uh, P2Y12 receptor uh, antagonist. So the question is, uh, whether ticagrelor would be better, better than clopidogrel in patients uh, with peripheral arterial disease. So this trial only included 13,000, I mean, included patients, the good number of 13,000 patients with just peripheral arterial disease looking at clopidogrel versus ticagrelor, and a follow-up was 2.5 uh, years looking at MACE outcome. There was no significant difference between ticagrelor or clopidogrel over the course of the trial. Uh, there was no significant difference in terms of overall uh, TIMI major bleed, but uh, there was actually slightly increased uh, difference in terms of ble any bleeding uh, in general. But again, that trial was negative for ticagrelor uh, versus clopidogrel in these patients. Now, to summarize, for single antiplatelet therapy uh, for patients with stable peripheral arterial disease, there is ample evidence to support single antiplatelet therapy um, and there is uh, good evidence from the Capri trial to support clopidogrel over aspirin. There was no difference, really significant difference, between clopidogrel and clitacagrelor. Now, how about dual antiplatelet therapy? So all those people think that, okay, so more is better. Not necessarily. It could be harmful, right? So what, is, what if we add clopidogrel to aspirin versus aspirin alone? At the, for patients with stable peripheral arterial disease. And the answer comes from the CHARISMA trial, looking at 15,000 patients with established cardiovascular disease uh, or multiple atherosclerotic risk factors. So these patients already have or had uh, uh, cardiovascular disease or they have risk for them, okay? And looking at aspirin plus clopidogrel versus aspirin alone, and the follow-up is 2.5 years. The primary endpoint was 
uh, maize, and there was no really significant difference, if you will, and this uh, actually is shown here, there was no significant difference, uh, clopidogrel plus aspirin versus uh, aspirin uh, versus, uh, plus uh, placebo. Um, and another matter of fact, you see the primary endpoint was not significant, but also you see there was significant increase in moderate bleeding. So aspirin clopidogrel in stable peripheral arterial disease uh, or, or, you know, in general, cardiovascular disease didn't make sense. However, looking at the subgroup uh, analysis for high-risk patients, those patients that actually did have the diagnosis of stroke, MI, or PED, not necessarily they have the risk factors. If you look at those, there was significant difference in terms of reduction of MACE, but if you look at the PED subgroup, there was no significant difference. So um, those patients with peripheral artery disease did not benefit from adding Plavix to aspirin in that regard. And the famous PLATEAU trial was published in uh, 2009, looking at, <clears throat> actually, it's a Kegelor plus aspirin versus clopidogrel plus aspirin, and that's in patients with acute coronary syndrome. 18,000 patients that presented with acute coronary syndrome going on to Kegelor plus aspirin versus clopidogrel plus aspirin. So technically, it's a Kegelor versus clopidogrel plus, uh, plus aspirin. And follow-up is actually one year. What you see that there was significant reduction in the MACE outcome with the Kegelor versus clopidogrel, and uh, there was no significant difference in terms of cumulative for uh, major bleed. That's the whole group. But what if we want to look at the PED subgroup that has actually about uh, 1,000 um, patients? There was numerically less of uh, MACE outcome in the PED subgroup, uh, but that did not meet statistical significance. And then so, um, so the so the Kegelor plus aspirin probably not better for the PED subgroup, but for the acute coronary syndrome whole. Uh, group was significant reduction. That's why you see some of interventional cardiologists that want to talk on their behalf. They, some of them used the Kegelor versus Plavix in addition to aspirin after intervention. So how about patients with stable uh, coronary artery disease? So 21,000 patients in the Pegasus STEMI 54 trial randomized into Kegelor 90 or 60 milligram versus uh, plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. So now dual antiplatelet versus single antiplatelet in chronic stable coronary artery disease. Follow up for one year looking at mass outcome. You saw significant reduction of the mass outcome for both 60 and 90 milligram of tachygalor um, versus as plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. Um, and if you look at Timmy uh, major bleeding endpoint, that comes with an expensive increased Timmy major bleed in the combination group versus aspirin alone. And then um, if we look at the subgroup analysis of patients with peripheral arterial disease in the Pegasus um, TIMI-54, there was actually a significant reduction of MACE outcome in the subgroup analysis that included peripheral, patients with peripheral arterial disease. And that's mostly seen with the 60 milligram twice a day. That's why sometimes I think about, you know, if we have a non-responder to Plavix with patient, in patients with peripheral arterial disease, you know, stable peripheral arterial disease, we might use the Kegelor, but I use 60 milligram, not the 90 milligram based on the Pegasus trial. So now, dual antiplatelet uh, therapy summary for stable peripheral arterial disease, there is some evidence to support dual antiplatelet therapy over single antiplatelet therapy. But remember, there is that increased risk of, of bleeding, mostly major bleed. And maybe you should reserve these, uh, this combination for patients with high thrombotic and low bleeding risk. Now, the protease activated receptor 1 antagonist of Vorapaxar that was looked at the TRA to uh, P TIMI 50 uh, trial, looking at about 27,000 patients with previous MI ischemic stroke PED, um, and looking at Vorapaxar plus placebo as add on therapy to aspirin plus minus Plavix, and follow up is three years looking at MACE outcome. There was significant reduction, actually, of the MACE outcome with Vorapaxar. Um, uh, plus uh, versus placebo, and that came with the expense of increased bleeding, as you see here. And then, so uh, what happens in the subgroup analysis for just the PD patients? There was no significant difference for MACE, uh, but if you add the PCD plus PD patients, there was significant reduction of MACE with Vorapaxar versus placebo. And if we look at the sub-analysis analysis of patients with PED, um, actually showed significant reduction of male, which is major advanced lymph events, uh, 
with Vorapaxar versus placebo, and you see the subgroup here for that benefit. There was significant reduction of acute lymph ischemia, a graft free thrombosis, and so forth. So um, I think you might consider using Vorapaxar as add-on therapy for patients with stable peripheral arterial disease, but remember, there is an increased risk of, excuse me, uh, moderate or severe bleeding, 1.5 times higher risk, as you see. For a while, people thought that warfarin might be an option for patients with stable peripheral arterial disease. That, the answer comes from the WAVE trial, looking at maybe adding warfarin to aspirin versus aspirin alone in patients with symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, about 2,000 patients looking for, uh, for MACE in three years. Actually, there was no significant difference adding warfarin to, uh, to low-dose aspirin versus aspirin alone for MACE or MACE with severe uh, limp event or ischemic limp uh, event, but the, that came actually even with the price of increased risk of, of bleeding or life-threatening bleed. So adding warfarin always to the mix might not make sense. You might actually harm your patients than helping them in stable peripheral disease patients. Now, we're going to talk about a landmark trial that was published three, four uh, years ago, 2017, the COMPASS trial. Looking at, remember I showed you that atherothrombosis with fibrin and you need to knock down the uh, anticoagulation cascade to probably improve the outcome by reducing risk of atherothrombosis. So that COMPASS trial, looking at rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram twice daily. When I say rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram twice daily, people think about Eliquis or Apixia because that comes also in 2.5 twice daily. So I have to make sure that this is different. Uh, that's plus aspirin. So looking at 27,000 patients, very good sample size, 27,000 patients with stable coronary artery disease, plus minus peripheral, stable peripheral artery disease. Actually, 27% of these patients had just uh, peripheral artery disease as, as the entry for, for the trial. And looking at rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram twice daily, plus aspirin versus uh, rivaroxaban, 5 milligram twice daily versus aspirin alone. Just moving forward, we are not going to talk about the rivaroxaban, 5 milligram twice daily, because that dose was not found to be effective, okay? So let's just talk about 2.5 milligram twice daily versus aspirin alone. Full up 20, actually the trial had to stop early because there was significant reduction of MACE outcome with rovaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice daily versus aspirin alone. And you see the separation of the curve occur occurred early on, significant reduction. And that came with an expense of increased major bleed right here, but there was no significant difference in fatal bleed or critical organ bleed. So there was significant difference of major bleed, mostly explained by increased GI uh, bleeding led to hospitalization, but no significant difference in fatal bleed uh, or critical organ bleed. So what happens in this, these 7,000 patients with, uh, with uh, peripheral arterial disease, looking at subgroup analysis for those patients with peripheral arterial disease, that's a very good sample of 7,000 patients with, st with uh, stable coronary artery disease. There was significant reduction with the rivaroxaban uh, vascular dose, which is 2.5 milligram twice daily ver uh, plus aspirin versus aspirin alone, um, as you see in the, in this, in the, in the uh, Graph, uh, graph there, but also if you look at the male outcome, significant reduction of major uh, limb adverse event with uh, uh, rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice daily plus aspirin versus aspirin. And as a matter of fact, 44% uh, relative risk reduction of acute limb ischemia, 70% relative risk reduction of amputation. That's incredible to see this reduction with this combination. So this has kind of created a lot of noise out there and the literature and the, um, um, and the expert uh, guidelines as well, too. So now, um, so the question that comes from my colleagues in the vascular surgery department, or maybe from the cardiology department, do we put every single patient with stable coronary artery disease and or PED on rivaroxaban plus aspirin? No, always there is a risk and benefit. So who are those patients that really benefited from the combination? So that comes, the, an, the answer comes from a post hoc analysis uh, from the COMPASS uh, trial that was published actually in 2019, looking at uh, risk factors from the REACH uh, registry. 
as well as from the CART scoring. So CART stands for classification and regression tree, looking at different risk factors. So what the paper uh, found that those patients with polyvascular involvement, two or more vascular bed involvement, like carotid plus peripheral artery disease, uh, coronary plus peripheral artery disease, or those pa and or patients with EOG far less than 60 or patients with heart failure had really the most benefit. So probably those patients you should consider adding this uh, combination. And based on the card risk factor also, they found also polyvascular uh, involvement, heart failure, plus diabetes mellitus actually as major risk factors that benefited it the most from the combination uh, 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 therapy. So now, uh, how about summary for anticoagulation therapy for stable peripheral artery disease? There's no strong evidence to support anticoagulation with warfarin. Remember, we saw more bleeding with no significant um, difference, but there is really good evidence, strong evidence, to support the use of rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram twice daily in addition to aspirin, uh, especially in high-risk patients, poly those patients with polyvascular involvement, diabetes mellitus, CHF and, coronary, uh, and, and CKD, especially in those patients with low bleeding risk. Vorapaxar might be an alternative uh, based on the TIMID trial that we talked about, okay? Now, so we finished the first section of antithrombotic therapies for stable peripheral artery disease. Now we're gonna shift gears and talk about, you know, um, anti antithrombotic therapies for patients after open revascularization. So there will be open revascularization, there will be endovascular uh, revascularization. So uh, what about single antiplatelet therapy following open revascularization that comes from the ATC or the antithrombotic trialist collaboration um, uh, meta-analysis, which is actually, it's a huge meta-analysis looking, uh, looking at data from 287 uh, studies uh, that included more than 135,000 patients, looking at a comparison between antiplatelet therapy versus placebo, or looking at, uh, 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 looking at outcome differences between different antiplatelet therapies and a follow-up in two years. There was a sub-analysis of 2,500, around 2,500 patients with, uh, that underwent uh, bypass grafting and looking at MACE as outcome. It actually was uh, some kind of 22% uh, relative risk reduction of, of, of MACE on those patients that received peripheral grafting. But you see the line crosses the, uh, you know, uh, uh, you see that the dash actually crosses the, the line, so that's not significant, but we saw an odd of 22% uh, uh, reduction of MACE outcome in those patients that receive uh, peripheral grafting with antiplatelet therapy. So how about dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for those patients? That answer comes from the CASPA trial uh, looking at 850 patients undergoing below knee. So this is just important to realize that this is below knee. Uh, bypass grafting is a control on mice trial looking at clopidogrel plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. And the outcome was not MACE per se, but was a composite of graft occlusion, revascularization, amputation or death, so kind of a male outcome. There was actually no significant difference in the whole population and those patients that received the uh, 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 van uh, graft, but, uh, and, the, and the, that received bypass graft. But if you look at the sub-analysis looking at those patients that received the uh, prostatic graft, there was significant reduction of outcome. So if you have a, a patient with prostatic below knee graft and you worry about this graft going down, prosthetic graft, they might consider using a dual antiplatelet therapy because that subgroup of prosthetic graft uh, show, uh, showed significant reduction of the male outcome, but not the whole group that also included the vein graft. All right, how about um, anticoagulation following uh, open revascularization? The answer comes from the Dutch Brewer trial looking at 2,600 uh, patients going, infra, going uh, for infrainguinal uh, bypass a control on my trial looking at higher dose of warfarin or vitamin K antagonist INR 3 to 4.5 versus aspirin alone looking at graft occlusion and the outcome was actually not whole a lot of different in the whole group but if you look at those patients that received vein graft there was significant reduction of outcome so with anticoagulation with high dose of uh, of vitamin K antagonists, there was significant reduction of limp outcome if you were to use um, anticoagulation <clears throat> versus just aspirin alone. And you see that in those patients that received the vein graft, okay? 
So in the other one, and the CASPER was actually a dual antiplatelet the therapy that reduced the outcome for patients uh, with prosthetic graft, but with anticoagulation for patients that receive vein graft, okay? Now, another landmark trial that was published after the COMPASS trial, uh, the Voyager PED trial, that looked at uh, about 6,500 uh, adult patients undergoing open or endovascular revascularization. It's a control normalized trial looking at, again, rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram BID uh, plus aspirin versus aspirin alone, because we found that that was significantly important, out showed significant reduction of MAIS in the stable PED patients and CED patients. So now what happens in those PED patients that underwent revascularization, open or endovascular? So, and the primary endpoint was MAIS, like MI, ischemic stroke, and CV death, plus uh, acute limp ischemia and major amputation. So it was limp as well as MAIS uh, endpoint. And that was actually significantly better with uh, rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus placebo alone, uh, versus aspirin alone. And then uh, there was no significant difference in terms of the primary safety endpoints, which was semi major bleed, but there was an increased risk of uh, major bleed, none of which, again, it was actually fatal bleeds or critical organ bleed. And the, um, and the outcome mostly driven by the reduction of acute limp ischemia, as you see from the, uh, from the slide. There were also some secondary endpoint in the Voyager trial looking at acute limp ischemia with major amputation and, pl and planned index revascularization or uh, coronary <coughs> hospitalization for coronary and peripheral arterial disease related thrombotic event, all of which were lower with the rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram uh, twice daily plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. So now talking about antithrombotic therapy summary after open revascularization. So there is some evidence to use single antiplatelet therapy, right? Uh, however, dual antiplatelet therapy may be used like aspirin and plavix after prosthetic graft. Remember that CASPER trial? Um, and that's if leading risk is not that high. And again, it might make more sense to use rivaroxaban uh, uh, 2.5 milligram twice daily plus aspirin uh, in patients uh, uh, after revascularization based on risk and benefits and coverage. Warfarin might be considered after vein graft, remember from the BUA uh, Dutch trial. Uh, as there is a data from uh, uh, meta analysis looking at warfarin plus aspirin it actually showed uh, <clears throat> improved outcome, but that came down with increased risk of hematoma. Now, how about um, antithrombotic therapy after endovascular revascularization? Remember that meta-analysis uh, from the antithrombotic trialist collaboration? Again, it's the same uh, meta-analysis that we went over uh, after open revascularization, and there was insignificant reduction of the outcome after peripheral angioplasty, 29% relative risk reduction, but that was not uh, significant as you see from the, from the slide. Um, the MERO trial is actually a famous trial, although it's kind of a weaker trial because I guess the sample size, size was just 80 patients uh, going for peripheral angioplasty plus minus stenting, and those patients were randomized to receive clopidogrel plus aspirin versus aspirin alone, Follow-up was six to 12 months uh, looking for target revascularization. At, at six months, there was a significant reduction of target revascularization, but that was not, uh, did not persist to be significant at uh, 12 months, as you see here. So this is at six months. And they also, there was improved in additional days on hospitalization uh, because of target lesion. So the re-hospitalization re for, for uh, target lesion uh, vascularization was also lower with dual antiplatelet therapy by six months. There was no significant difference in terms of bleeding endpoint uh, between the two groups. So there is data for aspirin and plavix after endovascular, but the sample size is pretty small, right? And this is not like we're talking about 6,000 patients that we saw in the uh, uh, Voyager trial. So there are different trials that use silistazole, interestingly, uh, showed significant reduction. Different combination with silistazole plus aspirin showed better uh, outcome than teclopidine and aspirin for patency at 12, 24, and 36 months. Uh, better restenosis rate at 12 months and also better than aspirin in terms of reintervention at two years. So you might consider using Silistazole, really interestingly, not just to improve claudication that we've used for years, but also showed significant reduction 
of, of stent outcome or endovascular outcome as well, too. Going back to the Voyager trial, because two-thirds of the uh, patients that in, uh, enrolled in the Voyager PAD trial had endovascular uh, 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 intervention, so 65%, and uh, only you know, one-third that had surgical in, in, in intervention. The question that comes all the time, so what if we add aspirin to rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram, tristele and, uh, and aspirin, add Plavix there. So what happens if we add Plavix? Actually, that was allowed in the trial. About 50% of these patients uh, in the Voyager PED trial were allowed to be on Plavix, so 50-50. So, so, um, so we'll talk about that Plavix piece in a second. So remember that outcome from the Voyager PED trial, significant reduction of MAIS plus acute limp ischemia amputation. Uh, right, right there, and that's mostly driven by the reduction of acute limp ischemia. Looking at secondary endpoint, uh, there was significant reduction of revascularization for recurrent limp ischemia, and coronary or peripheral cause of thrombotic uh, nature, also hospitalization for any of these events was also significantly lower with rivaroxaban plus aspirin. So the Plavix effect piece, because People think, okay, so we had added Plavix for a while after endovascular intervention, so I can't feel like giving that happen away, okay? <clears throat> so that was looked at uh, as a sub-analysis of that uh, uh, Voyager PED trial. As you see here, those patients with, that went on clopidogrel or those patients that we did not go on clopidogrel, there was no really significant difference. You see the P of interaction was not significant, but uh, if you look at uh, ICH, ICTH uh, major bleed outcome, within 30 days, there was no significant difference, but there was an increased risk of major bleed if you were to use clopidogrel beyond the 30 days. So if you want to use clopidogrel first 30 days after intervention as an add-on therapy, you don't have strong data that did change the outcome, but we have data that if you go beyond 30 days, there was increased risk of uh, bleeding. So now the summary of antithrombotic therapies after end of, uh, revascularization, there is enough evidence to support dual antiplatelet therapy over single antiplatelet therapy. Um, if you look at, uh, again, rivaroxaban, uh, 2.5 milligram twice daily plus aspirin should actually be considered because there is a control on mice trial to reduce, thrombotic, uh, to reduce thrombotic event, but you have to weigh that uh, risk with uh, bleeding risk as well. Uh, clopidogrel plus aspirin is another option based on the Merrow trial. Uh, again, so listazole plus aspirin combination might be an option to reduce risk of restenosis and need for revascularization. Again, at the end of the day, you have to really weigh the risk and benefits of whatever antithrombotic therapy you're going to use. I know that this table is very kind of crowded. I appreciate uh, uh, our fellows actually who helped me put these tables together. I appreciate their help. Um, and then so um, this summarizes all what we talked about. So this table is talking about antithrombotic therapy in chronic stable PD. Uh, 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 patients, remember the CAPRI trial, looking at clopidogrel plus, so just as a summary that I'm giving you right now of the trials that we went on. There was a better outcome uh, with clopidogrel plus, uh, versus aspirin. The CLIPS trial uh, confirmed the uh, evidence of uh, superiority of aspirin versus uh, uh, placebo, as you see there. And the Euclid trial, there was no significant difference for MIS between ticagrelor and clopidogrel. The Charisma trial, the combination of dual antiplatelet therapy was not really that uh, of, of, of benefit versus aspirin in those uh, patients with stable peripheral arterial disease. The plateau also, it showed significant reduction with ticagrelor plus aspirin versus clopidogrel plus aspirin in, in acute coronary syndrome patients. The sub-analysis for peripheral arterial disease did not show significant difference. The Pegasus trial uh, for chronic CED patients, the sub-analysis of peripheral arterial disease showed significant reduction with ticagrelor 60 milligram twice daily plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. We talked about the Borapaxar, and actually that did not show significant reduction of MACE in the PED subgroup, but it did show reduction of male outcome. The WAVE trial adding warfarin plus aspirin versus aspirin, there was no significant difference. We talked a lot about the COMPASS trial showing significant reduction of MACE with the rivaroxaban 2.5 plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. This table summarizes the antithrombotic therapy after an open uh, revascularization. We talked in length about the uh, ATC mean analysis showing some reduction, 22% uh, 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 reduction of, of, of MACE. Uh, 
uh, in patients uh, that underwent uh, open revascularization with antiplatelet therapy versus aspirin alone. We talked about the CASPER trial, the whole population after uh, below knee uh, open revascularization. There was no significant difference, but those patients that received prosthetic graft showed significant difference. Uh, the Dutch uh, BOA trial showed uh, no significant difference of anticoagulation in the whole group after open revascularization, infraingonal open revascularization, but that subgroup that received vein graft showed significant uh, reduction. And then the Voyager trial, uh, rivaroxaban 2.5 twice daily plus aspirin, uh, was significant versus aspirin in terms of reducing MIS and uh, acute limp ischemia and amputation. The rest of the trials here that we did not go over, there were some combination of, of antiplatelet therapy with anticoagulation. Uh, the sample sizes were real low, so we didn't go over that. And the last table here is summarizing the antithrombotic therapies after endo revascularization. Again, the ATC meta-analysis showed some 29% odd reduction of the outcome after uh, uh, angioplasty with antiplatelet versus aspirin alone. Uh, the mirror trial, although the sample size was low, there was significant reduction of outcome at six months, but not at one year. And again, the Voyager trial showed significant reduction of uh, ma uh, major limp event as well as MACE with the rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram twice daily plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. We had covered some combination of celestazole and aspirin for improved outcome. Now, <clears throat> so this is a summary of all the literature. What, <laughs> what does the uh, societal guidelines say? So what do these guys say? What, you know, what, what do they recommend? I have to say that these guidelines were published after, I mean, before the Voyager trial was published and before the rivaroxaban got approved for the, its indication. So, so American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, the European Society of Cardiology, say that all symptomatic peripheral arterial disease should be on antiplatelet therapy, right? And clopidogrel, based on the Capri trial, might be preferred, okay? So that's what I do in my patients, you know, if, if they're stable. So I just give, give them clopidogrel if it's, if it's covered and they can't tolerate it. And the European Society of Cardiology, American Diabetic Association, and then 2021 guidelines in Society of Vascular Surgery, they say that you should consider using rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice daily plus aspirin in chronic PED patient to reduce male as well as mace, okay? And how about in, after open revascularization? So the Society of Vascular Surgery and, e, uh, and European Society of Cardiology consider DAPT after prosthetic bypass, remember? DAPT for, after uh, prosthetic uh, bypass, that's based on the CASPER trial for below knee amputation, uh, for below knee uh, uh, open revascularization, and that's why the ESC, it says in below knee. Uh, the European Society of Cardiologists say, oh, consider vitamin K antagonist after infraingolum bypass for vein graft, and that's based on the Boa, Dutch Boa uh, uh, trial. And then uh, SVS and ESC recommend at least dual antiplatelet therapy after endovascular, and the Society of Vascular Surgery also recommend extending to six months uh, to improve male outcome. So the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, as a general rule, say, hey, you know, use dual antiplatelet therapy after revascularization to reduce limb loss, but they say that there is no significant uh, evidence to support the reduction of MACE. What does MHI say? <laughs> so, um, as you know, we've worked on our antithrombotic um, or anticoagulation protocol since I started here in 2011. With the help of a lot of uh, stakeholders from pharmacy, from cardiology, from you guys, we developed this anticoagulation Bible, if you will, that we had for years. And so we recently added these protocols to our uh, recommendations. So what, so this is an algorithm about antithrombotic management, you know, in symptomatic PED. This is the fruit of all the talk. If a patient had a recent uh, is <clears throat> acute coronary syndrome after PCI, of course, dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, but all patients otherwise, you can consider single antiplatelet therapy, dual antiplatelet therapy, or RIVA, BID 2.5 plus um, aspirin. But if you have a patient with high limb risk and low bleeding risk, so if you're gonna ask me, what do you mean by high limb risk? Remember we talked about that post hoc analysis that showed those patients that had um, diabetes, coronary kidney disease, CHF and polyvascular involvement, all those patients with poor runoff vessels, you better really cover those, you know, with more just a single antiplatelet therapy. We have very good data 
the Vacampus trial for Rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams by Stiliflas aspirin. And if you can't get this covered for any reason, or patient is, is sensitive to this drug or can't tolerate it, you can uh, use Vorapaxar plus minus uh, aspirin plus minus clopidogrel, or you can use uh, DAPT. Or if the patient is not really a uh, responder to clopidogrel, we can use the Kegelor 60 milligram twice daily. For those patients with high bleeding risk and low limb risk, and we list for you high bleeding risk criteria, we actually should use just a single antiplatelet therapy favoring clopidogrel over aspirin. So now, antithrombotic management after revascularization, surgical or endovascular after surgical, we say a long-term rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice daily plus aspirin based on the Voyager trial over uh, dual antiplatelet therapy of vitamin K because the, the, uh, the evidence is much stronger from the Voyager trial, although there is no direct comparison per se. Uh, high limb risk patient, low bleeding risk, we say should use actually long-term rivaroxaban plus aspirin, if not an option, you have a vein graft, you use long-term vitamin K antagonist, and you have a prosthetic graft, long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. How about endovascular, long-term rivaroxaban, again, plus uh, BID plus aspirin over dual antiplatelet therapy for one to six months. Again, if you have really high-risk patients, we do really recommend long-term, again, rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice daily plus aspirin, but if not an option, then you would use long-term anti, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. Okay, so now in summary, peripheral disease um, actually uh, is underrepresented and undertreated major health problem. Uh, you know, in use of the appropriate antithrombotic therapy, you actually should be based on risk and benefit. Monitor patient carefully for thrombotic and bleeding event. Why bother? Just send those patients to us, okay? So consult vascular medicine or vascular uh, providers, surgeons. Um, uh, when you have these patients, be happy to help you in our clinics as well, too. I'd like to just put this final slide. I was uh, really happy to be, to perform this seventh medical mission to Gaza Strip in June of this year. I was able to get there with some uh, um, venous seal kits and I was able to uh, treat about 33 patients with peripheral uh, vein disease, if you will, venous insufficiency with stasis ulcers. And uh, just used uh, some venous seal kits here and uh, these are a bunch of surgeons looking into the new technique. I'd like to thank you here. Great timing, 10 minutes for questions. Um, I tried to summarize all the data for you, and I try to put some summary in at, at each section. I think the presentation will be available on uh, MHI website, I believe. But thank you so much uh, for coming this morning, and whoever is on the web, too. Thank you. Questions? Oh, please, yes. Dr. Thank you. Great, great presentation as always. Uh, Thank you. What do you do with the adherence to those guidelines? Let's say in a practice like ours that is very aware, and then you know, uh, let's say typical, smaller, less up-to-date practice. Yeah. So the question of Dr. Modi says, hey, you know, so what is the adherence on these guidelines? You presented great data. So what's you know who goes on what? The unfortunate thing that actually we published also a previous paper on. Um, um, uh, lipid lowering agents in proprietary disease. And actually, uh, the range between 37% to 70% of these patients with confirmed proprietary disease go on statins. We do very poorly, unfortunately. And if you look at antithrombotic therapy, you know, most of our patients are on probably just aspirin alone, and sometimes randomly they go on aspirin and plavix. We don't know how long we're gonna need to be on aspirin and plavix. Some of the providers or uh, interventionalists, they put the patient on, let's say, anticoagulation because they failed previous revascularization. There is not a whole lot of consensus. So that's why I think this kind of talk will help to kind of improve the, our practice to really cover those uh, patients with peripheral arterial disease with the right antithrombotic therapy. Because remember, those patients have very high risk for worse outcome than even CED patients. But you're right, it's, it's very underrepresented and undertreated. Unfortunately, PD patients, despite the fact that they are very high risk, they are undertreated. That's why every single day I receive an email from SBS or Society of Vascular Medicine trying to teach uh, peers about the newer data on this, you know, um, you know antithrombotic therapy post intervention. Dr. Sharkey? That was really a very, very good Thorough. So congratulations to the fellows for 
doing all the work probably, but I <laughs> <laughs> some of the work. I, guess. <laughs> I, uh, I I I think the table were really helpful. I mean, could you just tell me how you know the what is the definition of chronic stable peripheral arterial disease? That's so disease and and how do you I mean from your perspective in the vascular world. Yeah, so the question from Dr. Sharkey, how do you define chronic stable peripheral arterial disease? So there are two components into this. The patients have to be symptomatic because we don't really treat asymptomatic patients. There's no really whole lot of data for asymptomatic patients that you screen. Those patients, they have an ABI of less than 0.90, and they don't have symptoms. These were not mostly included in the trial that I kind of went on. Uh, but we actually talk about symptomatic means those patients with claudication or if they have significant ABI reduction or if, um, so especially if you say, what do you mean by significant? Less than 0 0.90, there are some papers looked at uh, ABI of less than 0 0.85. So those are the patients that were kind of lumped under uh, symptomatic, all plus minus those patients that had um, a stenosis of more than 50% based on peak systolic velocities and uh, also spectral ultrasound. So either you have to have uh, symptoms, you have to have a hemodynamically significant narrowing by looking at ABI of less than 0 0.90, 0 0.85, or if you have, you have to have also significant uh, alt, uh, uh, imaging uh, confirmation of more than 50% stenosis. Okay. Great. Any question from the web? Nope. Um, okay. No All right. Well, thank you and uh, happy holidays, everybody. And yeah. thank you.